Good afternoon. I am Tracy George, Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs and the Charles B. Cox III and Lucy D. Cox Family Chair in Law and Liberty at Vanderbilt. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to today's Vanderbilt Law School webinar on the law and politics of selecting Supreme Court justices. The event today is sponsored by the Dean's Office and the student chapters of the American Constitution Society and the Federalist Society. This afternoon, we are focusing our discussion on choosing justices to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. The timeliness of this topic is self-evident, and its significance is underscored by its place as the first question of last night's presidential debate. While our panelists have strong views, I nevertheless expect to have a far easier time as moderator than Chris Wallace did. Vanderbilt University is fortunate indeed to have on its faculty some of the nation's foremost experts on the topics of, in discussion today. Brian Fitzpatrick, the Milton R. Underwood Chair in Free Enterprise, is a scholar of federal courts, complex litigation, and constitutional law. Prior to joining the Vanderbilt faculty, he served as special counsel for Supreme Court nominations to U.S. Senator John Cornyn. He has written about the ideological dimension of judicial selection. Susanna Sherry, the Herman O. Lowenstein Chair in Law, has written extensively on constitutional law and the U.S. Supreme Court. Her most recent work has focused on the structure of the court, including the idea of term limits, and the impact of the idolatry of U.S. Supreme Court justices on the judicial system. Ganesh Sitaraman, professor of law and director of the program in law and government, teaches and writes about constitutional law and democracy, among other topics. He recently published an article on Supreme Court reform in the Yale Law Journal. Finally, Sharice Thrower, associate professor of political science, focuses on American politics with an emphasis on political institutions and their power. In 2019, she was chosen for an Andrew Carnegie Fellowship for her work on the reciprocal relationship between the executive and judicial branches. Each panelist today will speak for more than, no more than 10 minutes. At the end of their presentation, I will pose questions submitted through the Q&A function offered by the Zoom webinar. Please submit any questions that you have for our panelists there. The chat function is not available, so we will limit our questions to those through Zoom. Let us begin. I'd like to ask Brian to start us off. Thank you, Tracy, and welcome to students and alumni. Um, I uh, don't know Judge Coney Barrett well, but we did both clerk for Justice Scalia in different years, and I've gotten to know her a little bit through reunions that Justice Scalia held every year for his law clerks, as well as from um, academic circles. I've been uh, at conferences with her over the years. I think that she is an outstanding nominee to the U.S. Supreme Court. I think she is very well qualified and a very decent human being. Uh, she has mainstream Republican jurisprudential views. She's an originalist and a textualist, just like so many other Supreme Court justices are, just like Justice Scalia was. Um, and I look forward to her confirmation. Um, I, I'm sorry that she's going to be used as a political football in the food fight that uh, is going to take place between the Republicans and Democrats over judicial confirmations. Um, I don't think that she deserves to be treated like a political football, just like I don't think that Merrick Garland deserved to be treated like a political football. I thought that what the Republicans did to him for go was a real low blow. Um, and I think it is somewhat hypocritical to rush forward now after doing that to Merrick Garland. I think that was very unfortunate. Uh, but before we get too high on our high horses today in criticizing the Republicans for hypocrisy, I, I think it would behoove us to at least acknowledge that uh, this low blow that we see here over the last four years is just the latest 
in decades of low blows that each political party, Democrats and Republicans, have delivered to each other around judicial nominations. This is not the beginning of the low blows. This may very well be the end of the low blows, but it's not the beginning. And I think it's worth remembering how we got here. Um, most people blame the Democrats for starting the vicious cycle of low blows. Um, what they did to Robert Bork and what they did to Clarence Thomas. Now, I haven't studied all judicial confirmation processes in American history, so I really can't say independently whether what was done to Bork and Clarence Thomas, two very well-qualified, talented people, whether what was done to them was a new low. But it is widely perceived to be the events that started this chain of low blows. And so I'm just going to accept that for the sake of argument. Uh, things started in the 80s and 90s when the Democrats really tried to destroy Clarence Thomas and uh, really gave Robert Bork a very hard time as well. Uh, people didn't like that. They thought it was a new low in the confirmation process. So when Bill Clinton came into office, the Republicans wanted payback. That's how these things work with low blows. And the payback that the Republicans wanted in the Clinton administration was not to go after Ginsburg and Breyer. Uh, interestingly, why they didn't go after Ginsburg and Breyer, I'm not sure. They had a lot of material, frankly, on Justice Ginsburg. Uh, she was a pretty, pretty radical feminist in her day. When I worked in the Senate, I saw the, the file they had on Ginsburg with all of her golden oldies in it, where she advocating abolishing Mother's Day and Father's Day at one point in, in her career. But we didn't go there, and we let those two get through you know, pretty much unscathed as traditionally well-qualified nominees would. Instead, what the Republicans did as payback was they slowed down the confirmation process for Bill Clinton's lower court nominees. Uh, it took years for some of Bill Clinton's nominees to get a vote. I think the worst example was Richard Paez, who's now a Ninth Circuit judge, but he had to wait over four years before the Republicans would give him a confirmation vote. He eventually got one and was overwhelmingly confirmed. And it was just intransigence that the Republicans were holding him up for so long. Uh, Bill Clinton had to basically bribe the Republicans into giving his nominees votes by agreeing to nominate Republicans to the bench. There's a number of Republicans on the Ninth Circuit that Bill Clinton appointed just because he needed to get his Democrat nominees votes. And so that was a new low blow, holding people up for four years and extracting Republicans as the price to give someone a vote, someone who has overwhelming support for Senate confirmation. So that was a low blow that the Republicans did to pay back for Bork and Thomas. So then George W. Bush comes in and the, Rep and the Democrats, they want payback. They want to pay back for what the Republicans did to Richard Paez and the other lower court nominees. So what did the Democrats pull out of their low blow bag? They pulled out the filibuster. They started filibustering George W. Bush's lower court nominees. Uh, there's a famous example of Miguel Estrada, who's a very talented lawyer in Washington, D.C., nominated the D.C. Circuit, waited two and a half years to get past the filibuster. He had 55 votes, could not get past the filibuster, finally had to withdraw his nomination. The Democrats did that over and over again against judicial nominees of the president until there was a deal struck with these moderates, a gang of 12 or gang of six. I can't remember how many were in the gang. They finally decided to get rid of this attempt to filibuster. Um, but uh, I will note that uh, the Democrats nonetheless tried to filibuster both of Bush's appointees to the Supreme Court, Roberts and Alito, 
were both subjected to filibuster attempts by the Democrats. They didn't get to 41 votes, so they couldn't do it successfully, but they tried. And I will note that Barack Obama supported both of those filibusters against both Roberts and Alito. So um, then the Obama administration starts and the Republicans want to pay back the Democrats for filibustering uh, George W. Bush's nominees. So Republicans say, we're gonna filibuster Obama's nominees. And so the Democrats say, fine, if you do that, we're gonna do another low blow. We're gonna get rid of the filibuster for lower court nominees and we're just gonna ram our people through. And so that's what the Democrats did. They rammed their people through by getting rid of the filibuster for lower court nominees. Um, and then when the Republicans took back the Senate, they said, we're gonna pay you back for doing that. We're not gonna give Obama's election year nominee Merrick Garland a hearing. So then Trump comes in, the Democrats are mad as hell about what happened to Merrick Garland. So new low blows. The Democrats basically say, we're not gonna return any blue slip for a Republican nominee, for a Trump nominee. And we're gonna filibuster all the Trump, or, or at least the, uh, the Trump Supreme Court nominee, because we're mad about what happened to Garland as well, they should be mad. And so, uh, the Democrats didn't return the blue slips. They tried to filibuster Gorsuch. And so the Republicans said, fine, we're going to do another low blow to you. We're going to get rid of the filibuster now for Supreme Court nominees. And we're going to ignore the blue slips for appellate lower court nominees. So the Democrats are, are mad about that. And so Brett Kavanaugh gets nominated and they give him even worse treatment than they gave Bork and Clarence Thomas. Um, and you know, whatever we think about the merits of the allegations of Brett, against Brett Kavanaugh, I think we all have to acknowledge that how the Democrats handled those allegations was abominable. Every time someone is nominated to the Supreme Court, there is personal allegations like this made against them. Usually they're totally, un uncredible and no one takes them seriously, but personal allegations like this are handled in what's called executive session. The Judiciary Committee meets an executive session outside of public view to handle allegations like this. The Democrats did not do that. They held this allegation close to the vest until the hearings were over and then they publicly released it so it would be resolved in, before television cameras instead of first attempted to resolve an executive session. That was a very low blow. And so now the Republicans are paying the Democrats back with a push in 30 days to get Amy Coney Barrett confirmed to the Supreme Court. Both sides are guilty of low blow year after year after year. And unfortunately they have destroyed the confirmation process, these very, talented people are now used as political footballs and there are there are attempts to destroy them personally it's a very sad place that we have gotten to and i think the only hope and I'll, I'll close on this and turn it over to the next speaker but i think the only hope in escaping this vicious cycle of partisan recrimination is to finally hit rock bottom and then get rid of life tenure for Supreme Court justices because life tenure is the cause of this vicious cycle of recrimination. And if we haven't hit rock bottom with this nomination, I suspect we will hit rock bottom when the Democrats take over and they expand the size of the Supreme Court. And my hope is if that comes to pass, both sides will see we cannot continue like this and we will get rid of life tenure for Supreme Court justices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. That's a strong note to end on. I noticed that people are submitting questions through the Q&A. If you have a question uh, to follow up on Brian or on one of our other speakers, please let me know. I am delighted to turn it over now to Susanna Sherry. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you, Brian. As you might imagine, I don't agree with much of what you said, um, but it was certainly very interesting. Um, I'm not going to take you on today, however. Instead, I want to do three things. I want to describe the constitutional provisions regarding the Supreme Court appointment process. I want to pro provide some historical context for that process. 
And I want to suggest a possible democratic response if Judge Barrett is confirmed before the election, but the Democrats win either the White House and or the Senate. So let's start with the constitutional provisions. They are minimal. All the Constitution says is that the president has the power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to appoint judges. That's it. That means he can nominate anyone he wants, and the Senate has full discretion whether to confirm or not confirm, even whether or how to hold hearings. Indeed, until the 20th century, generally the Senate didn't hold hearings. They didn't hear from the nominee. There was often no debate, and there was often no roll call vote. So basically, there is no constitutional rule on what should happen, in particular on what should happen if a vacancy occurs close in time uh, to the election. And that is where the historical context comes in. Justice Ginsburg died 46 days before the election, which of course is going to be held on November 3rd, in late September. With one exception that I will mention in a minute, no justice has been confirmed if the vacancy occurred later than March. That's 228 days before the election, almost five times as long as the period that we're facing now. The one exception was Chief Justice Hughes' vacancy. Uh, uh, Justice Hughes' vacancy. Justice Hughes resigned in June of 2016. President Wilson was at the time running for re-election, which he did eventually win, and he nominated on July 14th a little-known uh, Justice John H. Clark, and the Senate confirmed Justice Clark on July 24th. So that was closer than the March uh, vacancy, but it was very unique circumstances. Hughes had resigned from the Supreme Court in order to run against Wilson for the presidency. So if the Senate had waited for the election, that might have allowed Hughes to appoint his own successor. And even so, even if you don't count it as an unusual uh, circumstance, the Hughes vacancy still occurred in June, 144 days before the election, more than three times longer than the 46 days of this vacancy. And that is the closest the Senate has ever confirmed a nominee before an election. Presidents have nominated, and the Senate has failed to confirm nominees. When vacancies occurred 67 days before the election, 106 days before the election, 194 days behind, before the election, and 269 days before the election. That's almost 10 months versus the six weeks that we're looking at now. And of course, that 10 month failure to confirm was Mitch McConnell and the Republican Senate refusing even to hold hearings on President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland. And so the current Republican Senate's determination to confirm Judge Barrett before the election is not only historically unheard of, it is also the height of hypocrisy. How should the Democrats respond? Well, they obviously can't do much very now, very much now, and they won't be able to do much if Republicans keep the Senate. But if Democrats win both the Senate and the White House in November, or even if Democrats win just the Senate, they do have options. Option number one, which requires both Demo a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president, is something that I have previously been opposed to, and that is to pack the court by expanding the number of justices. It's perfectly constitutional for Congress to do so. Congress has the power to set the number of justices, and the size of the Supreme Court has changed over time. But I think that um, packing the court, expanding the size of the, num of the court, the number of justices, is playing politics with the judiciary and it's setting a dangerous precedent. It is, as I think Brian explained, a low blow. It is essentially playing hardball rather than playing by the unwritten historical rules. But if the Republicans are this hypocritical, uh, this unwilling to abide by either the historical precedent 
or their own prior reasoning from just four years ago, then I think the Democrats have to respond in kind. Under these limited circumstances, I think court packing is warranted. Option number two. Option number two has an advantage. It will work even if Trump wins re-election as long as the Democrats get a majority in the Senate. So here's another provision of the Constitution. Under the Constitution, all federal judges, including Supreme Court justices, serve during good behavior. What that usually means is for life, but judge, judges and justices can be and have been, at least judges have been, impeached by the House, convicted by the Senate, and removed from office if they act contrary to good behavior. Based on what I said earlier, I think any judge who accepts the nomination under these circumstances, that is so close to a very tight election and with a Senate that only four years ago thought that 10 months was too close, any judge who accepts the nomination under these circumstances has no principles and no integrity. And a lack of principles and integrity is the very antithesis of good behavior. So my view is that any judge who accepts this nomination and is then confirmed should be impeached, convicted, and removed from office. So if Judge Barrett is confirmed and the Democrats do win the Senate, regardless of whether Biden or Trump wins the presidency, I think the House should impeach her, the Senate should convict and remove her for showing an appalling lack of integrity and principles. And this is not about Judge Barrett or her views or her personal circumstances. I would say this about any judge who accepts the nomination under these circumstances. Of course, to accomplish either option one or option two, the Democrats have to win a Senate majority in November. And they also have to win the White House if they want to increase the size of the Supreme Court. Which is to say, this election is absolutely crucial for the future of constitutional rights. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Um, as I expected, this was going to be a fun panel and it has been very fun so far, but we have very considerate speakers who've allowed us to transition between opposing views. It is therefore um, with eager anticipation that I turn it over to Ganesh to take us um, from where we are right now. Well, thanks so much. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, get into how I would read the history, which in some ways uh, differs with Professor Patrick Fitzpatrick's account. Um, but what I wanted to do instead was start from the position that the Democrats win the presidency and win the Senate uh, and the House and are trying to think of what the different options are for potentially reforming the Supreme Court. And uh, I thought what I would do is just briefly try to walk through six different options that are on the table that people have proposed that are being discussed and debated um, and give you a flavor of, of what these options are, and then some sense, uh, a little bit vague, but some sense of how you might think about which one of these options or which package of options uh, you like the best. Um, so the first, uh, which uh, Professor Sherry mentioned, um, is expanding the size of the court. Uh, constitutional, yes, the, the Constitution does not fix the number of seats on the Supreme Court at nine. This number has fluctuated throughout our history, and it is possible that the Democrats could expand the size of the Supreme Court by two or four justices uh, at this moment. Um, one of the benefits of this approach, in addition to being constitutional, is that for Democrats who are particularly interested in things like reproductive rights, civil rights, voting rights, uh, legislation on climate change, or, or anything else that might come up in the next few years, is that a 7-6 court uh, that is uh, assuming um, uh, Judge Barrett is, is confirmed and then the Democrats pack the court with four additional nominees, uh, a 7-6 court would be highly likely to uphold most of the legislation that Democrats might want to pass in the first few years of a Biden administration. One of the downsides that people mention a lot about this approach is that it might lead to a kind of tit-for-tat retaliation um, that 
the Democrats will expand the size now, and then the Republicans will expand it again in the future, and back and forth more and more, as Brian uh, said, low blows uh, on indefinitely, um, potentially, and maybe this will never stop. Um, I, I tend to be a little bit skeptical of this approach, um, and I am skeptical for a couple of reasons. First, I do think it's possible that we might see tit for tat forever, um, but I also think there's two things that we might also see in addition to that. First, we might see just the creation of a new equilibrium around a large, a larger Supreme Court. Um, throughout our history, we've had moments where there have been big shifts in policy and politics and in how the court has been understood. Um, often these big shifts have been over, have involved fights over the Supreme Court, uh, and they create a new normal, a new ideological consensus. The most recent turns in this sense um, are FDR creating a 40-year liberal era in America, and then Ronald Reagan creating a 40-year conservative era. Uh, and in each of these eras, even people of the opposite party largely agreed with the terms of the debate set by uh, the founder of that era. It was Nixon who said he was a Keynesian. Bill Clinton said the era of big government was over. Um, so we might see that there's actually, in some sense, a new equilibrium that emerges, and so we don't get tit for tat. Um, the way that I think might happen, and this is the second point, is that you could imagine Democrats uh, increasing the size of the court, passing a bill called HR1, which they uh, put forward in the last Congress, um, that would uh, deal with voting rights, um, gerrymandering, a wide variety of other democracy rules, um, pass reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and a lot of those things would expand the franchise in such a way that would actually make it harder for Republicans to win. And the reason why I say it would make it harder for them is because in many states, what Republicans have said explicitly in some cases like Georgia, is that the only way that they can win is if they suppress the vote. And so not suppressing the vote, passing legislation that does that, having that legislation be upheld by courts, uh, might actually force the Republican Party to change from its current situation over a period of time because of losses repeatedly in, in the uh, ballot box. And, and, and what that would mean is that um, you might actually not have a major shift in the short to medium term. In fact, over time, you would just see a different kind of Republican Party with Democratic victories along the way uh, to make that a reality. Um, okay, so that's our, that's our first, uh, first situation, um, expanding the size of the court. Um, the second one, which, uh, which Brian mentioned, is 18-year terms, term limits for Supreme Court justices. Um, last week, uh, a bill was just introduced in the House um, to create 18-year terms. The basic idea is that there would be a new justice every Congress, um, so each president would get two picks. And the idea is that regularity here would solve one of the crazy things about our current Supreme Court structure is because the, is, is, and that's that the entirety potentially of constitutional law can turn on an essentially random occurrence, like when someone happens to pass away um, or on strategic situations like a justice being able to determine for themselves when they want to retire. Um, and that this is not a rational or sensible way to set up a system of selecting Supreme Court judges. Jimmy Carter gets zero appointees in four years. Uh, President Trump gets three potentially in three years. Um, it makes no sense to design a system this way. So the 18 year term plan has as a positive regularity in these appointments. Um, people argue that it'll also mean that we won't be ruled by a gerontocracy, um, that instead uh, we will have uh, reasonable aged justices um, and that maybe it'll even stop the push for ever younger justices um, so that because that is based on an assumption that they can serve longer uh, in their out years. Um, I, have, uh, I am skeptical of the 18-year term plan uh, for a few reasons. The first is that I think the 18-year term plan um, actually entrenches the politicization of the court because it means that every single election from now until the end of time will be about the Supreme Court. Every presidential election will involve a Supreme Court pick. Every midterm election involves uh, a Supreme Court pick. Um, it, it may be that that's where we already are, but this approach certainly doesn't make it better. Uh, it just entrenches and guarantees that we will remain in this place. The second problem I think with this approach is that I suspect it will make our justices worse at judging. Um, and the reason why is that uh, I don't think that you'll actually see people um, who are older and who will just retire onto the lower courts, which is what the proposal um, uh, contemplates. Rather, what I think you will see is that people will start thinking about the Supreme Court as a jumping point for their next job. Maybe to cash out and become a lobbyist, maybe to become a Fox News or MSNBC commentator, or more likely to run for Senate, President, Governor, uh, or something else. 
Um, we've had justices throughout our history who have run for office. Professor Sherry mentioned one who ran for president uh, from the position of Supreme Court. Our very first Chief Justice, John Jay, ran for governor of New York from the Supreme Court, lost the first time, uh, won the second time. Um, I think what we might see is 40 or 45 year old nominees spend a decade on the court um, or 15 years, see their term coming to an end and instead run for office, in which case you might have opinions that are designed for campaigns rather than for the rule of law. Um, and I think that would be a downside. Um, these are underappreciated downsides. Um, and I think we should at least go in open, uh, open eyes, even if you, if, you, if you like this proposal overall. Okay, uh, a third proposal. Um, this is one that you may have heard of uh, because Mayor Pete um, talked about it on the campaign trail. Uh, it's called the balanced bench or 555. And the idea here um, is that you'd have five Republican justices, five Democratic justices, and those 10 would pick five justices from the Court of Appeals to serve with them for one year at a time. Um, obviously now, if, if uh, Judge Barrett is confirmed, it would have to be 665 uh, for there to be some balance, but the basic idea holds. Um, and the idea here is that we recognize that partisanship matters, but we also don't want it to be the only thing that matters. And so you're gonna force judges into picking some judges, and it may just be one. There might be uh, a log rolling on the other four, but you might get one that everyone has to agree on. Um, and the forcing mechanism in this proposal is that if they don't agree, there's no quorum and they're not allowed to hear cases for the year. Is that a bad thing? Maybe. Um, some people might say we want the court to be able to hear cases. Alternatively, a court with less power uh, and that isn't hearing cases could actually be desirable because it might force more effort into our political branches. Um, and this is a proposal that people uh, think is a good one because it, it has this balance element like we have in many independent agencies and commissions. We can talk more about constitutionality and other things if people are interested. Um, a fourth proposal is a kind of lottery system or a panel system that you already see on the Court of Appeals. Um, there's different versions of this. Um, one that Bernie mentioned uh, during the campaign uh, is to basically take judges from the Court of Appeals in panels of nine, uh, they would hear cases. Um, the way that I proposed operationalizing this is that they should hear cases uh, for two weeks at a time. Um, and then go back to their regular jobs as lower court judges. Um, the consequence of this would be that any individual lower court judge nomination would not matter that much for Supreme Court purposes. Um, it would increasingly polarize lower court judge, judge nominations, but those are, uh, if we haven't already noticed, uh, completely polarized already. Um, so that's a proposal, one of the benefits of which is to massively turn down the temperature of nominations because there won't be these nine nominations that have outsized influence. It also has the benefit of something that Professor Sherry has written about, which is it takes away the kind of uh, circus-like rock star element of Supreme Court justices um, and the odd uh, fact that much of our constitutional law turns on the idiosyncratic views of an individual. Um, for many years, it was Justice Kennedy. For many years before that, uh, Justice O'Connor. Um, but it makes no sense that one person should have so much impact over the Constitution. Uh, the last two proposals um, are ones that are really designed to reduce the role of the Supreme Court in our political system. So the other proposals I've mentioned so far are about the structure of the court. And to some extent, they reduce its importance and its strength in our system. Um, but these other two are fundamentally focused on that. One is creating a supermajority requirement for striking down statutes. Um, that Congress could pass a law saying that it has to be 7-2 or 8-1 uh, to strike down a federal statute. Um, this could be combined with some of the previous uh, proposals that I've mentioned, but one thing it would do is it would force a lot more action into Congress. If you want to change the laws, fight it out in the political branches, don't go running off to the courts to save you. Um, and the hope here is that what it would mean is that really what the courts are overturning are things that everyone agrees are unconstitutional, uh, not just a faction in a 5-4, 6-3 partisan uh, kind of sense. The last approach um, that many people are discussing now is, is called jurisdiction stripping. Um, and it's a very thorny issue constitutionally. Professor Fat Fitzpatrick has written quite a bit about this. Um, but the idea here is basically that Congress could strip the power of the courts uh, of the Supreme Court to hear cases on certain topics. Um, and that again, what this would do is force people who are interested in relitigating those policy questions to do so not through litigation, but through politics. 
um, and to go to their elected representatives and try to get the laws changed. Um, proponents of both of these approaches say that the real problem in our system is not just an irrational structure, but is the fact that we have a Supreme Court that over 200 years, and especially over the last 100, has gained more and more power for itself, um, has decided to insert itself into the, into the major policy political battles of our time, and that this was not the role of the Supreme Court at the start or for the first century, and it should not be the role of a court in a democracy, uh, and that what we should want is a political system and a constitutional system that respects the will of the people rather than a small number of unelected justices. Thanks. Thank you, Ganesh. We've received a number of questions. I want to remind uh, the audience that when you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A feature of the chat. And so I'm now delighted to ask Sharice Thrower to join our discussion. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to be an interloper from the political science department um, and getting to hang out with all these smart people from the law school. It, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, so I wanted to talk to to you today about um, the politics behind these judicial appointments from a political science perspective. And particularly, I was asked to talk about um, how the, both the president and members of the Senate can use judicial appointments to serve the broader interests. Um, so I'm first gonna talk about um, what political scientists have said about that question and then apply those sorts of theories to what we're seeing in the current nomination. Um, so starting with the president's motivation, we generally think about the president having um, many goals while he's in office, the primary goal being to pursue those policies um, that, that he aligns most with. And so this can be based on ideological preferences from the liberal to conservative um, standpoints, um, also serving his party's goals. Um, but generally we think about presidents, everything presidents do to kind of serve those ideological or policy uh, interests. Um, now, of course, presidents have other goals such as um, being reelected or making sure that members of his party and other branches of government are reelected and also institutional power, legacy. Um, but all of these things we generally view um, as being related to the president's policy goals as well. Um, and so when we think about the president pursuing these policy goals, we traditionally think about the president doing that in the legislative process or the administrative process. Um, but what I want to talk to you today is about how the president can do that through the judicial process. So the rulings that come out of, from the Supreme Court and other courts in the federal judiciary, um, that has implications for the way we see public policy and practice. Um, and so obviously the president has incentives to try to influence that process um, in order to pursue his policy preferences. Um, and the president can do that in a lot of different ways. Um, traditionally, we think about the president being able to um, kind of classically threaten to um, not enforce judicial rulings as his stance as the head of the executive branch. Um, and so threatening non-enforcement is sort of a mechanism for the president to influence judicial processes. Um, but one kind of primary way that presidents can influence uh, judicial policymaking is through the appointment. So the people that they put um, in these positions, in these judge positions, um, can obviously influence um, policy making. Um, so I want to ask, well, why can presidents use judicial processes, particularly through appointments, to achieve their policy goals? Um, so taking a step back and thinking about how judges make decisions and how justices make decisions, in the political science literature, we find lots of evidence that judges use their own policy preferences um, to decide big cases. So they decide cases based on their own ideology. And obviously the outcomes of these cases determine the outcomes of public policy, which again, as I said before, presidents care a lot about. Um, and even if we think about judges and justices being motivated by other things, such as you know, interpretation of the law, application of the law, things like that, um, we know that their own ideology can also shape their ideas about how to interpret the law as well. Um, so all that comes down to is who the president puts um, in place in these judgeships um, that has a lot of um, influence on what public policy is going to end up being like. Um, so because of this, we know that presidents have incentives to appoint like-minded judges. So if you're a conservative president, you want to obviously um, appoint conservative judges. Um, however, they face limitations in, in doing so. 
Um, so as Professor Sari mentioned, in the Constitution, we know that the presidents can nominate members of the, the judiciary. However, the Senate must confirm members. So the Senate is the major barrier that presidents face when they're trying to kind of appoint like-minded judges. And we know that members of the Senate also have their own goals. They, they have their ideological goals. They have goals of reelection. Um, and so that's gonna motivate their actions in determining when you know, they're going to pass through the president's nominees and when they're not. Um, and so obviously they can block the, these nominees, they can delay the process as, as some of us have already talked about. Um, and if we kind of think about how the um, confirmation process has played out over time, what we've seen that is that this process has become a lot more contentious over time. That there's been an increase in divided government and polarization. Um, and so these confirmation processes are a lot more difficult. So we've seen an increase in the rate of rejection rates, particularly in the lower courts, uh, uh, um, confirming lower court nominees, and an increase in the delay in this process. So it's taking longer to confirm these nominees and, of course, seeing more vacancies. Also, over time, we've seen increased involvement in interest groups um, and increased um, um, pre media presence in covering these nominations. And these sorts of nominations have also become a lot more salient in, in the eyes of the public. So all these things combined has led to a more contentious process. And we see that presidents themselves have been going public more on their Supreme Court nominees. Um, so over time, a lot more contentious um, in this process. So now I want to talk a little bit about what, based on sort of these political science theories, what we think is going to happen with um, um, Judge Barrett and, and, and this sort of confirmation process. Um, so first think about what, what will happen if Judge Barrett happens uh, to be confirmed and placed on the court. Um, so looking at her record, we know that she's been a, a, a proven conservative judge, that she has a history of um, sort of anti-abortion, anti-immigration um, stances and cases and, um, you know, have stated that she wants to um, um, sort of repeal um, the, the ACA, you know, that she's clerk for Scalia, so she has a proven conservative record. Um, and in political science, when we think about appointments and we think about the way that, that the Supreme Court makes decisions, um, we think about that there's nine, there being nine judges on the court we place a lot of value on the median judge, so that judge that sits in the middle of all the ideologies of all the justices on the court. Um, so prior to um, this vacancy occurring, Judge Justice, Chief Justice Roberts um, had served as this median voter of the court. So, and, and this has been demonstrated in a lot of recent court cases where he's been the swing vote. Um, now, if we place Judge Justice Barrett on the court, um, we're going to see that the ideology of the court is going to shift even more conservative, given her kind of what we know about her conservative stances. So that median of the court, the swing vote, it's going to shift from being Roberts to being around Kavanaugh is what political scientists have been estimating. Um, so sort of just in a nutshell, we know that the court is going to become more conservative. Um, with the appointment of Barrett. Um, and now we can think about how this kind of, how this will play out in the confirmation process. So knowing that the court is going to become more conservative, how's the Senate going to act? Um, well, we know the Senate is held by Republicans um, and that right now there are 53 Republicans in the Senate. Um, and so in order for her to be confirmed, you just need a simple majority. Um, and for her to be denied, we need four defectors. Um, and right now, the, the numbers just aren't there for the Democrats. Um, so there's only two possible uh, Republicans that have stated that they might defect. Um, other ones are kind of sticking to the commitment of confirming Barrett. So she's likely to be confirmed. Um, and so the consequence, we're gonna get more conservative courts. Um, however, the one, my, my last point that I wanna make is, even though we're likely to see a, a more conservative court, it's likely to be passed through, you know, we don't have the filibuster. Um, the Senate has been, the Senate leadership has been committed to make, making this process pretty quick and Democrats are sort of powerless in blocking this. Um, I, I would just, I just want to emphasize the point about public opinion and what that role might play. So even if she gets confirmed, um, we need to look at how public opinion is going to react and the, the, the um, consequences for election. So in a recent ABC poll that was held last week, 
um, 57% of Americans said that, stated that they think that this whole nomination confirmation process should be um, held off until after the presidential election. Um, unsurprisingly, you know, that if you break it down by political party, you know, most Democrats support that, most Republicans oppose that. But if we look at the independents, which is kind of the swing sort of voters, 61% um, of independents share that view. Um, and so what this means is this might be a tool that Democrats can use to mobilize voters. Um, and, and if you also look at the polls, this has been an increasingly salient issue for um, Democratic and independent voters. Um, so even though we might get, you know, very likely to get a conservative court, they might have electoral um, implications for mobilizing Biden supporters, and then also maybe le leading to um, electoral seat losses for Republicans um, in the House and the Senate, if this is a salient enough issue for voters. Um, and I'll leave that at, at that and turn it back over to Tracy. Therese, thank you very much. So we're now gonna move to the question and answer phase. And um, I've gotten really terrific questions and I'm gonna work on trying to get uh, through all of these questions um, by synthesizing them and presenting them to our speakers. So I wanna start with some questions that came up that really focus on the Supreme Court and society. And one of those questions um, relates to whether or not we could really view our discussion today and its central place um, in the presidential debate last night and media coverage as evidence that the Supreme Court has simply become too powerful and or anti-democratic as a discussion. And I'd like to get Ganesha's thoughts on this in terms of really grappling with the fundamental question of the proper role of the Supreme Court. Yeah, so there's there's a, a big question and, and how you think about the um, different Supreme Court reform options ha has a lot to say with how you think about this broader question of what the role of the court is in our, in our democracy. Um, for much of the late 20th century, people justified the role of the Supreme Court in terms of judicial review of statutes, um, largely on a theory that what the court was good at doing and would be able to do is protect minorities from the tyranny of the majority, um, you know, phrases that we've all heard before. Uh, and there's a real question, I think, that, that people grappled with is, well, is that the right thing for a court to do? Isn't the word of the majority uh, a good thing in a democracy? Um, and I think what's happened is over time, uh, we've seen two things. One, including in the political science literature, but I think all of you um, have a sense of this just in general from, uh, from things in the news and, and from your, the general sense people have, uh, is that people question whether Congress is actually doing what majorities want a lot of the time. Um, and much of what we see out of political science is that Congress is extremely responsive to the views of the wealthy and small interest groups, but not necessarily the views of the public at large. Um, and so if that's the case, then maybe the problem is that Congress is not actually majoritarian enough rather than is too majoritarian, which is one set of problems. Um, and then a second set of problems is maybe the Supreme Court is not actually serving the interests of the minorities that it was supposed to protect from majorities either. And so over the last uh, couple of decades, there's been uh, literature talking about this as well. And I mean, not just for racial minorities, but also in terms of um, who the Supreme Court serves uh, in, in economic cases and in other things. And in some of those cases, it may not be that they're serving a small number of, of minorities in the sense that they're protecting um, them in a way that's good, uh, often what people think um, is that the Supreme Court has become increasingly pro-business over the last 20 years. Um, so again, that it is not majoritarian, it's counter-majoritarian, uh, but in a way that actually might be problematic for, uh, for the majority in striking down uh, rules that Congress has put forward. Um, so one big question, I think, is do you think that the Supreme Court uh, it, or, or maybe a better way to put it is, are you more worried about tyranny of a majority or tyranny of a minority? Um, if you're extremely worried about tyranny of a minority, whether defined as a minority of wealthy people and interest groups, um, or a tyranny of a minority in terms of uh, a, a, a faction of the Republican Party, or, um, or something of this sort, you might want a smaller size for the court um, you might want different kinds of political rules to make democracy and Congress more responsive. Um, and the court is tied up in all of those questions. Um, so I think that's one of the big places of the role of the court in our society. 
Um, and some of these reforms, the supermajority requirements, the, the jurisdiction stripping reforms, are really designed to get at that problem uh, in ways that other things are not. I think the last place that I'll just I'll flag is if what you really are concerned about is not even the role of the Supreme Court as an institution in our society, but what, if, but what you think is that the Supreme Court is just yet another policymaking body, um, and a lot of people do think that, um, then you might just care what the policy outcomes of that body are. And I think this is where a lot of Democrats who are in favor of court expansion are, which is we're mostly concerned with the outcomes that are going to come out of this court. Uh, and the way to guarantee good outcomes is to guarantee the right kind of people who will vote the right way. Um, and this is part of what has shifted in terms of personnel, I think, on the court in the last 40 years. Um, you know, even though the court has always been uh, highly involved in political debates, you know, there was a question um, that, that popped up about the, the early court um, in the early republic. Um, there were debates and fights between the Federalists and the Jeffersonians over effectively manipulating the size of the courts uh, in, in and around the election of 1800. Um, there were major issues around the court as a political matter, including increasing and decreasing its size around the time of the Civil War. Um, obviously, Franklin Roosevelt had a court packing plan that didn't work, um, but he still got a lot of picks on the Supreme Court. Um, this has always been a part of our, our history on some level. Um, but one thing that's shifted is that in the last 40 years, we've really seen the rise of legal movements that are organized, well-funded, uh, and that push forward a set of ideological views about the law um, and about the courts, and that try to build pipelines for um, judges uh, from the time they're in law school all the way forward. Um, and so this, and, and, I, and I would commend to you, the best work on this um, is really on the history of the conservative legal movement. There's a book called Rise of the Conservative Legal Movement. There's another called The, the Federalist Society, um, talking about uh, the different ways those organizations from the 1970s through the 2000s really emerged as powerhouses in building up um, this sense of the courts. Um, that has been a big component also of this story, both in terms of the ideology of judges, who's in the courts, um, and the role that the courts play more broadly. Thank you, Professor Sudaraman. So I want to then pivot as in thinking about that to thinking about questions uh, related to given the observations that Ganesh made in response to that question, how we can think about what, if anything, we should do. So one thing, a question that came up, and I think Brian is really um, a good fit for you, is whether or not originalism, to the extent that we're often conflating conservatism and religion and originalism, rightly or wrongly, um, originalist perspectives, which are becoming, if especially if Judge Barrett is confirmed to the Supreme Court, will become more common on the Supreme Court. If originalism would actually dictate that the justices themselves, through their decisions, should do things to try to pull back on the power of the court and its central role in decision making. Well, that's a good question, Tracy. And of course, Justice Scalia always said that the reason why we become so exercised about these Supreme Court nominations now is because the court was making up too many constitutional rights. And if the justices were just originalists, the court would not be such a political issue. Now, obviously, I, I, I don't think he's been proven right about that. We've got a lot of originalists up there and it's still a political football. Why is that? Well, one reason is, now the question is, are the originalists gonna undo all the rights that were made up by the justices before originalism became the, the norm on the court? And so people are still exercised about the court because now the originalists might take away what the non-originalists uh, did. So maybe that's one explanation. Maybe another explanation is, uh, you know, the court is always gonna be a political football because uh, of judicial review. Even originalists are gonna strike down statutes on occasion. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, there's no avoiding the uh, political saliency to these positions. Um, you know, I, I disagree with Ganesh in so far as I think that the political salience would go down if we did regular, regularize these Supreme Court nominations by having the staggered 18 year term every two years, another justice would uh, come up, every president would get two each, each term. I, 
it may make the Supreme Court an issue in every election, but I think it's going to be a low level issue because if you don't get your favorite Supreme Court justice this time, just wait two years and maybe you'll get your favorite Supreme Court justice that time. I, I really think it de-escalates all of this in a way that I'm not sure the, the interpretive methodology has been successful in de-escalating. Thank you. So the Supreme Court reform idea. Um, lots of questions, little time. So uh, uh, Susanna, um, I want to pivot and ask you more about who should serve on the Supreme Court, given that we know the court's central role and the prominence of members of the Supreme Court. Um, you know, one of the, there are a number of things about uh, Judge Barrett that stands out with her nomination, but they include the fact that she would be the sixth Catholic if confirmed and would be the only non-Ivy League law graduate um, with her law degree coming from Notre Dame. So could you talk a little bit about um, when we look at judicial nominations in the context of the court, uh, what we might be expecting and should think about with Supreme Court justices? Well, one of the things we should think about is, is, is the, are the nominees that we see today and the justices on the court today, how do they compare in some sense um, to earlier generations of justices. And of course, um, the court is in some ways much more diverse than it ever was, right? I mean, the first um, African, the first uh, Jew was appointed in uh, the 1920s, the first African American was appointed in the 1960s, the first woman in the 1980s, and so on. But um, in a lot of other ways, the court is much less diverse than it was. As you point out, um, she will be the first, not the first justice, but the only justice on this particular court who didn't graduate from an Ivy League uh, law school. That's not traditional. I mean, traditionally, uh, justices came from all over the country and from lots of different law schools. Um, they also had served in a lot of different positions that today's justices have not. Um, assuming that uh, she is confirmed, um, uh, six out of the uh, nine justices um, will have served as uh, Supreme Court clerks, um, and all but one will have served pro previously as Court of Appeals justices, and that one is Justice Kagan, um, who was actually nominated for the Court of Appeals, but then was not uh, confirmed. Um, and so uh, they're very similar in those sorts of ways. Uh, and so I, I like the idea of diversifying them, in some, of diversifying the court. Um, however, the other thing that has changed is that um, justices used to be appointed fairly late in life after they had accomplished a lot. And what they had usually done was practice law and then sometimes sit on a state court, occasionally sit on a uh, court of appeals, uh, but they had sometimes in state, we had state legislators, we had senators, former senators, we had people who had all kinds of experiences in life. And these justices just don't. And, and that worries me, that they are essentially have all had similar backgrounds. And the fact that um, uh, Judge Barrett did not go to an Ivy League law school is a plus, but on everything else, she basically meets the same uh, criteria that all the other justices do. And in particular, um, I'm on record, I have written that we should not put law professors on the Supreme Court um, because law professors are used to thinking for themselves, not collaborating with anybody else, having basically the power to write anything they want to write, which I love doing, um, but that means that they are less likely to be collaborative and cooperative and compromising when they get on the court because they've always been sure that their ideas are right. That's what we do as law professors. We think our ideas are right. So as I said, um, that's um, uh, I, we have to stop putting uh, law professors on the court. And on that, uh, Barrett falls down. Thank you, Susanna. So I have time for just one more question. And so Sharice, I'm gonna throw this to you. So um, how will we know if the Supreme Court selection process actually impacted the election? Yeah, I think, so I think that question is hard to observe just by looking at politics and election and the outcome. But I think one way that we can get at it is we'll see it in survey responses. So I'm sure lots of surveys will be taken asking respondents, you know, if the Supreme Court selection process, you know, made them more likely to turn out to vote, influence their votes. Um, 
I suspect in the, whether or not it influenced their vote, I, you know, I think the electorate is so polarized now and there's sort of just very little movement on, you know, how people vote, but there will be movement on whether or not it mobilizes voters. Um, and I think we're going to see that in, you know, just by asking them after the election. Um, and then I think the more sinister response to that question is that, you know, if there's something that's contested in the election, um, which is a very good chance based on what President Trump has said thus far, uh, questioning the legitimacy, legitimacy of election, um, it could be determined in the Supreme Court, like we saw with the 2000 election. Um, and so maybe the more sort of pragmatic, sinister answer to that question is that, um, you know, if the sitting president is able to put one more person that might be voting in favor of President Trump staying in office, that could definitely shape the election by having this person confirmed now versus later. Well, that is a powerful note to end on. I just cannot thank enough this outstanding group um, that spoke with you today and thank all of you for attending. Um, we appreciate it. A recording of this event will be available. You'll be able to find that link through the website that also had information about how to register for it. Again, thank you very much and thank you to our speakers for their outstanding performance today. We appreciate it.